In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. David the shepherd, who, whom the Lord selected to fight Goliath, who went through a great deal of trouble with Saul the king, who replaced him, who uh, committed adultery, homicide, who was forgiven and restored by the Lord in His great mercy, who had to pay the price of his sinful life from the hands of his children who chased to kill him, approaching the end of life, the Lord, through the prophet Nathan, spoke to him and told him many things, among which the following, David, a house will be built for me, the temple, but it will not be you building it, but your son and my son is the one who will build that house. And we hear this, the son of David and the son of God, we think of Christ immediately, who built the temple, the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem. But David was instructed by the Lord, and he took this with great uh, care and love for God and great devotion. His son, who was to follow him, Solomon the wise, was a young man and unexperienced. And uh, David gathered all the people and told them, my one son, Solomon, whom God has chosen, God has chosen, is young and inexperienced. And the work of building the temple is a great work. Think of us building the church. It's a great work. For the temple is not for men, but for the Lord God. We build the church, the, church, the temple, but what we have in mind is not that this is going to be for man to play the sports, to do the classrooms, to have weddings and party. The temple is for God. And yes, we might be doing all these things for God. <coughs> Different perspective on everything. According to all means possible, I prepare gold, silver, precious stones, and he lists all of those here. Marble for the house of my God. And David says, Because I took pleasure in the house of my God, I gave to the, to the house of my God gold and silver over and above what I procure for myself. Because I love the house of God, the church, the body, Christ. I prepare to give towards the building of that. And now here I am, I give over and beyond that. I prepare for my house of my God over and above all I prepare for my consecrated house. And he lists 3,000 talents of the gold and 7,000 talents of refined silver to overlay in these the walls of, this, of the sanctuary and so on. The top of the pyramid of the leadership, the king himself stood up and exceeded giving. Guess what followed? When you have such a strong example, the ones below him followed. Then the heads of the families, the princes of the sons of Israel, and the captains of thousands of, of hundreds, with the officers over the king's work, offered willingly, offered willingly, they gave for the work of the house of God so many thousands of talents of gold, silver, bronze, iron, precious stones gave them to the treasury of the house of the Lord into the hands of the caretaker. And then the amount and the number of coins and they gave is huge that amount. Then, pay attention to this, the people rejoiced as a result of their willingness for they offered willingly to the Lord with their whole heart. Wait a minute. The temple wasn't even built. And they were rejoicing. Why is this? Because they gave willingly and abundantly with their whole heart. Seeing this, King David, the top, rejoiced greatly. Immediately, King David said a beautiful prayer, after which he said this, But who am I 
And who are my people that were able to be zealous in offering to you? For all things are yours, and of your own we give to you. Sounds familiar? Tasaik ton son, your own of your own. Father will just do this in 10, 15 minutes, bringing everything we have in front of Christ. Here we find David prefiguring in the worship of the time what was fulfilled in Christ and what we will fulfill, what we are fulfilling today in the liturgy of the Word and of the Eucharist. For all things are yours, and of your own we give to you. Remember, the temple, the church is not ours, it's God's. Neither are the resources that we have ours, they are God's. For we are strangers before you, and sojourners, as were all our fathers. Our days upon the earth are as the shadow. And there are none that remain. All go, O Lord our God. As for all this abundance which I have prepared that a house should be built to your holy name, it is out of your hand, and all is yours. You see how beautiful David made himself a vessel of the blessings of God for building his house? I know also, Lord, that you search the heart and you love righteousness. In other words, every single heart from those who gave, you know exactly what's going on in there, and you see the righteousness of those. As for me, in the sincerity of my heart, I willingly offer all these things. And now I see your people who brought themselves here joyfully to offer willingly to you, O oh Lord, keep on the guard these things in the thoughts of the heart of your people forever and lead their heart toward you. He prayed. Think of him bringing thanks, worshiping just like we do now before the time of Christ. And I give my son Solomon a fitting heart to keep your commandments. The father says, and I'll give my son the only begotten one to keep the commandments. And didn't he? The only one who did so. Then David said to all the congregation, now bless the Lord your God. And everyone in the congregation blessed the Lord God of their fathers and bowed down before the Lord and the king and the king <coughs> building the church in novato in monterey in carmel wherever it starts with the top the temple the first temple that was built in year completed in 957 before christ had david who started this and solomon who built it they were the head who is the head of us, of our community, trying to build the church? Christ. Christ is the head of the church. Did he give gold and silver and precious stones and marble? No, he gave far more than that. He gave himself, his life, his blood, his body on the cross. Who's next? The hierarchs of the church who gave up everything to follow Christ and serve. Who else is leading in the community? The priest. All these human beings, not divine human, must follow the example of David of giving sacrificially, abundantly, freely, joyfully for the others to follow. That's why priests tithe. What's next in line? The leadership of the church, the parish council, the ministry leaders. If we expect others to give joyfully and abundantly, we must follow the examples of the, of the leaders of David's community and our calling. Let us give one another and our whole life to Christ our God. And in our liturgy, we do not stop with blessing our Lord Jesus Christ. He has fulfilled the law. He has completed it. We come bringing him tasaik ton son and receiving in exchange for what we bring, what we give, 
his very life, the Holy Trinity. We partake of that. We receive a foretaste of the kingdom to come. How much higher are, you, are we than David was? Somebody told me recently, Father, why don't, you ne- why don't you preach on the epistle reading too? Well, today is the time. St. Paul writes to the Corinthians, urging them to give. Not for building a temple or a church locally to put walls, but the building the church of God as the body of Christ. The church in Jerusalem was going through dire straits. They needed money. And St. Paul, with great craftiness, went after Macedonians and Corinthians, checking on their faith, praising them, also somehow making them butting heads one against the other when it came to virtue and generosity. And today, he outlines a few principles for giving in the church, for building the body of Christ, the temple, you name it. By the way, we don't have a temple anymore. We call this the church, not the temple. The temple is long gone, for almost almost 2,000 years. So St. Paul writes to the Corinthians, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. The first principle, give bountifully, open hand with generosity. Why is this? The more we plant, the more bigger, the bigger crops we get. The fathers of the church comment on this, a few of them. The time of giving is now, today, before we die. Because when we die, no more giving. So principle number one, give bountifully, including to the temple, to the church, to the altar, not only to the poor alms. The second principle, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart. Give deliberately according to a purpose that we think about, and based on that we design the way we give, we think about it, we talk it with our spouses, we pray about it, and we make a conscious effort that that giving is done deliberately. Not only abundantly, bountifully, but deliberately as well, with thinking and design and planning work in mind. And how are we to do this? Not grudgingly or of necessity. Not grudgingly or of necessity. This points to the third principle of giving freely, out of the heart, without compulsion, without being pressed upon. David the king didn't order his people, you must give beyond your tithing, because they're all tithing, by the way. You have to bring, you know, another quarter of your income and all the coins that you have. No. People stepped out freely, and we heard this three, four times, how important this was for their joy and the fulfillment of the task of building the temple. Not only that, but of worshiping God. Listen to what St. Basil says about giving freely, joyfully, and bountifully. Fourth century directives for the early church. People who give reluctantly or under compulsion present a blemished sacrifice which should not be accepted. He's saying we might be bringing sacrifices, including ourselves, our bodies, our spirit, to the altar. But those that we bring reluctantly and under compulsion, which means without joy, not free, are blemished sacrifices, offerings. Is this important? Absolutely. In the context of receiving Christ as our life, as our master and king, how can we come with anything else but the most, the brightest of us and what we have and give joyfully and give abundantly and give deliberately? So are these principles that we find so beautifully described in the book of Chronicles and the story of the building of the temple. I will ask you now, do you still want to build a church? Of course. Of course, 
There's room to repent. There's room to do better. And the grace of God is abundant upon us. And that is what can change the hearts of people for them to engage this way. You know, the Monastery of Life-Giving Spring in Dunlop, about 26, 28 nuns there, they are going through a project of building a new site that uh, will close the courtyard and also have a much larger kitchen hall and cells for the nuns. A new chapel at least, if not more. It's a beautiful setup that was designed to be about $6 million. The nuns own nothing. <laughs> they gave everything joyfully, abundantly, deliberately. And the church is there, the chapel is there, and now this project in the last years came to happen by means of funds that poured in as needed, in real time, in real time. Great faith, great prayer, great love for Christ. And the project now is almost done. They went over a little bit. No fundraisers in the monastery. People just contribute and somehow the Lord and St. Nikiforos the leper, who is watching over these, provided to them. St. Paul writes in the same text that you have in front of you here, after giving these principles, outlining these principles of giving bountifully, deliberately, and freely, he says this, And God is able to make all grace abound towards you. God can do that, can He? He raised the son of the widow of Nain. He rose from the dead. He can give that grace, but listen, what for? That you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. In the worldly things, God will give you to have sufficient, not to go through the roof, if you can manage that, but all you need from God is to have sufficient. But in the spiritual realm, the spiritual blessings, he will give abundance for every good work. And how beautiful do we see this at the monastery? In the worldly things, they look poor because they don't have anything. But in the spiritual realm, abundant grace through which the walls have been raised and the cells are being populated and their prayers for us are being said every day multiple times. Glory be to God. Such is the grace of God for us to use wisely according to His will. And to live in that sufficiency, our responsibility to turn that faucet on and off and look for the abundant grace that He bestows on us. Finally, we build the church of God every time we gather together. We celebrate His mysteries. We pray for one another. St. John Chrysostom tells us that we have a huge task in our hands. This is not God's. It is ours. It is much bigger than God's. Do you realize this? That we're called to build the church, the body of Christ, a task which is bigger than what God is doing? St. John says this, God is doing the smaller things, but you, believers, are called to do the big things. God is doing, is taking care of the earthly things your food, that parish, your body. You need the food. God is taking care of the rain, of the sun, of the earth turning, spinning so many times per year, going around the sun. He holds that for you. But I will all pass away. You eat the vegetables, drink the milk, see the light. We age and we die. However, St. John says this, spiritual nourishment the Lord has entrusted, entrusted to us. Since by our own will, we can decide whether our fruit will be abundant or not. How much power God entrusts to us to make a decision about our salvation. Willingly, as a spiritual nourishment, giving for the purpose of eternal life. Giving abundantly, giving deliberately, giving freely, giving joyfully, living with the necessities and rejoicing as David did and his people by the abundance of the spiritual gifts that the Lord gives to us. Amen.